person. It's not Jesus plus anything. But the gospel is just that. It's just the gospel. And so we've talked about that. And we've, we've challenged some ideas we have about uh, the gospel, about how we um, not only come to Christ, but how we stay in Christ and all the things that come with that. And so as we kind of wrap it up over the next couple of weeks, um, we, I hope to kind of wrap up some of the things we've talked about. But, uh, uh, but I hope, you know, this is always the worry I have is that we kind of get bored with a, a book of the Bible, but I hope that's not the case. I hope you're engaged in it in your own personal study as well. And uh, if you ever have any questions or thoughts or, or concerns about something, I said I'd love to connect with you. I'll get you a cup of coffee and we can hang out and talk about it. And uh, I make pretty good coffee, by the way. So if you just want to experience a good cup of coffee, come by and we'll have one and I'll, I'll make it for you. So, um, but uh, if you guys want to turn uh, to Galatians chapter uh, 5, uh, verse 16 is where we're going to be today uh, through uh, verse 26. So I'm going to read it. Then I'll pray and we'll get going, okay? So if you guys want to follow along with me. It says, but I say, this is Paul talking to the Galatians, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify to the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, works, or, uh, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, God, be our guide here today. We, we ask you to help us to understand what you meant by these words, what your intention was as you breathed them into existence. We pray that our hearts would connect, our hearts would understand, our hearts would apply, and tomorrow we would be different because of what we've heard today, God. And you have that power, and only you have that power, to change us from the inside out. Through your word, through your spirit, through your people, God, help it to be the case for us today, God. Help us not to come here because we're marking it off a list of things to do, God. Help us to engage with you today, to be expect, expectant that you will speak to us, God. And God, I pray for anybody who's never trusted in you, God. Maybe this is their first time. Maybe this is, uh, this is a time they're learning, they're searching and, and longing for more in their life, and they're here to, to seek that out. And God, I pray that you would open their heart to understand the gospel, God, and they would respond in faith today. And God, we lift all this up to you and ask you to be with us as we open your word. Guide us and uh, help us to understand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, we, I want to start off with a quote today. This lady named Elise Fitzpatrick, uh, she's written a, diff a lot of different books. You can write her name down. She's a really good author. But she has this quote from one of her books. It says, our choices are predicated upon what we think is good, what we delight in, what we find most desirable. The truth about our choices is that we always choose what we believe to be our best. We always choose what we believe will bring us the most delight. Do you hear what she's saying there? We always, our, our, in, our inclination, our heart's desire is to choose the thing we believe will bring us the most delight. That's just human nature. We are by nature happiness seekers, pleasure seekers. We want to find the things that make that bring us most happiness, most joy, most fulfillment, most satisfaction in our lives. Our natural bent is to seek what we think feels the best and will bring us the most happiness. And that's a God-given thing. Did you realize that? 
We're going to flesh that out as we go through this passage. But the problem, our biggest problem, is that we most often are looking in all the wrong places and all, all the wrong things to find happiness and satisfaction and joy in our lives. And that's exactly what Paul is hitting at today, is that we, as happiness seekers, are looking in all the wrong places to find the satisfaction we long for. But the longing and the desire is not necessarily the ungodly thing, the thing that God wants us to suppress. It's not that. It's, 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 it's the thing that he wants us to pursue. And so as we look at this passage today, keep that in mind that everybody in this room, we are all on a journey, on a pursuit of happiness. We, we're looking for it. We're, we're, we're searching for it. We're turning over rocks and we're, we're looking for it in every way we possibly can. And so what, what, this, what Paul's saying today is, okay, the, we're, we're on this pursuit. We're on this journey towards happiness, towards fulfillment. Let's talk about what that looks like in God. Okay, so I want to I start off as Paul started off. If you look at verse 16, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What Paul does is he starts this passage off by saying, Listen, if you are a Christian, if you've trusted in Jesus, if, 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 you, if your life is in Christ, then you have a battle that's waging on inside of you. Everybody that's trusted in Christ. Now, if you've not trusted in Christ, let me tell you this, there's not much of a battle a battle going on in your heart right now. Now, the battle might be that you are convicted of your sinfulness, and that's why you're here today. You're convicted that your life is not where it needs to be, and, and so you're here today to say, okay, what's, what's wrong? And I'm telling you, what's wrong in you is that you don't have the Spirit of God living inside of you, that you've never trusted in Jesus, that there's not this battle going on. But if you're a Christian today, you know this battle, right? In Romans chapter 7, he has, Paul uses similar words that he does in verse 17 here. Uh, in both, he, he talks about, has, he says, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are not or these are opposed to each other. Listen, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. We feel it. Like all of us feel it. It's like, I don't want to go down this. Like I know this is wrong and this is not God's way and this is not what he wants me to do and how he wants me to talk or how he wants me to live or what he wants me to think about or how he wants me to use my body or how he wants me to use my computer or how he wants me to use my money or how he wants me to use whatever it is that we're using or say whatever it is we're saying or think whatever it is we're thinking. We know that that's not his plan. Like we're convicted in our hearts that that's not what he wants for us. But for some reason, we're like, I just, I just, with the things I want to do, I can't do and the things that I can't that I don't want to do I continue to do that's what Paul says in Romans 7 right and we're like why is it Lord why can't we do the things I really want to because there's a war going on inside of us and the war is between the gratification of the flesh and the life in the spirit. The gratification of the flesh is saying, okay, what is my, what feels good to me right now? What's going to gratify my flesh? Sometimes gratification of the flesh is, you know, I'm going to pursue that person in an intimate, intimate relationship, and that's going to satisfy my flesh. Or maybe it's if I just had more of this, or if I just owned this sort of thing, or if I just did this activity, then that is going to gratify my flesh. And so Paul's saying the life of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit and gratifying the flesh, are opposed to one another. We're going to flesh that out a little bit more, but then he says the war is because one is pulling you this way and one is pulling you this way, and they are opposed to one another, right? So there's a war going on inside of us. The flesh, so the flesh, let me just kind of flesh that out a little bit. That's, that's a pun intended. The flesh thinks, the delayed laughter, I like that, but nonetheless. The flesh is our life pursuits outside of Christ, right? It involves the mind, the will, the emotions, and the physical body, right? Sometimes we think the flesh is anything we do with our physical body, but it, it involves the mind, it involves the will, like I desire to do these things, right? It, does, it involves our emotions are under our flesh, right? If Just because you feel like it's good doesn't mean that it's the right thing, right? Just feeling like it's good doesn't make it, oh, oh, then God wants me to feel good about it, right? So he must stamp approval on that. No, that it's the flesh, right? The, another author uh, defines it this. The flesh was Paul's term for everything aside from God in which one places his final trust. 
That's what the flesh is, right? It's anything outside of God for us. Like it's anything outside the, the, of God that, that we're seeking fulfillment from, right? So the spirit that he's talking about here is, is the Holy Spirit, right? So we have a spirit that lives inside that we have. Like we have the soul and the body, right? We're flesh and we're, we're, we're soul. He's not talking about our soul here. It's not like the war is with our spirit against our flesh. It's not, that's not a duplicity. It's not like a, a dualism sort of identity. Literally, the spirit of God who lives inside of us, if we don't have the spirit of God, then we're driven by our flesh and our emotions and our, and our desires. That's, that's ultimately, you see it. I mean, we see, I, I, I was there one time. If I'm outside of Christ, then I'm, dri I'm driven by whatever feels right, whatever the world defines as right. That's what I'm going to pursue, right? But then in Christ, we have this war because the Spirit of God, when you become a Christian, the Spirit of God empowers you, indwells in you, comes inside of you, and you become, you, you are, are, are literally indwelled or lived in by God. And so the Spirit of God who Jesus gives us an understanding of what the Spirit of God does, he lives inside of us and he's, he's, he's moving us away from the flesh and so then we have the war that's going on inside of us. If you look at the heart behind the war, in verse 17, Paul saying the desire or the battle is between the spirit that is in those who are in Christ and the flesh and our natural pursuits of satisfying our worldly desires. So if you were nailing down, like if you were going to get down to the heart of what the battle is all about, the, this is a battle for where we are seeking our satisfaction, our happiness, and our fulfillment. That's at the heart of what this is all about, right? We're people that desire happiness. The battle is where we're going to find the happiness. The battle is where we're going to find the satisfaction. The battle is where we're going to be fulfilled. Are we going to be fulfilled by the pursuits of the flesh? Let me tell you something about the pursuits of the flesh. And you guys are going to see this as we go throughout. But I, uh, one of the analogies that was used this week as I was reading was the, the pursuit of the flesh is like pursuing a mirage in the desert. You guys have heard of this before, right? A mirage in the desert is, is, is something you see on the horizon and you're thirsty and you're desiring the fulfillment that that mirage is going to bring. But when you get to the mirage, you end up drinking sand. And that's what the pursuit of the flesh is really all about. And as we go about it, we're going to see that. And so as we're reading this passage, though, there's an assumption, like I am assuming something because, it, because I ran into, into the same place. I ran, we, when we read this passage in its, in its entirety, there is some, a natural bent that we believe certain things that this passage is saying that the passage really isn't saying at all, okay? And so what I want to do is go through real, real, real quick three things that Paul is not saying in this passage, okay? In this entirety of this passage. And so, the first thing Paul is not saying in this passage is that we must suppress our desires for happy, our desire for happiness in order to please God. That we have to push off our pursuit of happiness in order to please. See, this is what we believe sometimes. Okay, God, I, if, if I'm going to please you, then I cannot try to be happy because you're just going to be mad at me. And so we feel like the way of a Christian is getting rid of all the things in our life that we enjoy. I can't have that in my life. I can't enjoy video games. I can't enjoy like hanging out with my buddies. I can't enjoy sex in my life. I can't enjoy money in my life. I can't enjoy anything in my life. I got to push all that stuff off and I just got to walk this walk that's drudgery and, and, and just is not very fun and it's not very in, in, enjoyable and I'm sure not happy because I just got to try to please God. And so we read that passage in verse 16 that you that if it's either the life of the of the of the uh, spirit, life in the spirit, walking in the spirit, or it's gratifying the flesh, right? And we read that and say, well, man, most people want to gratify the flesh, right? Like we want to like enjoy life. But can't do that if we're walking in the spirit. And we read it like that. And see, this is the bad thing about it. And Paul shares when he gets down to the 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 works of the flesh, he says, like all of those things, like you know, you read them, you're like, oh, drunkenness and, and orgies and like rivalries and idolatry and sexual morality and impurity, all those things like 
Yeah, they sound bad. But when the culture frames them, they don't sound all that bad, right? Because like we want sexual expression in our culture. And so if we can like express ourselves and, and, our, and, 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 and sexually express ourselves however we desire, then that's freedom and that's enjoyment and that's pursuit of what makes us happy. And God says, that's bad. No, see God, like, so you can't enjoy anything when it, in, in the realm of sexuality at all, right? That's, is, that, is that what Paul said? That's, that's not what God's saying. That's not what Paul's saying in here. He's saying, God has a framework that he's created in scripture on how we are to enjoy the creation that he has made, sexuality included. If you're really going to enjoy it and get the full, the full um, uh, 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 intention behind it, then God has the way. When it comes to like finances, right? Well, God doesn't want, he, he always talks about how rich people can't go to heaven and all this different. God just doesn't want anybody to have anything. He just wants us all to be poor. Is that what he's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying he doesn't want money to be a king and a ruler and an authority in your life. He wants you to be free. So he wants you to give. He wants you to be generous. He wants you to be free from the, from the love of money. The love of money is the root of all sin or all kinds of sin. Like that's what the Bible... So because we are under the authority of money in our lives. And, Paul, and, and so what God's saying is, when, through Paul here, he's saying, no, listen, I'm not saying you can't enjoy money. What I'm saying is I've given you the, the, the true source of your satisfaction that money's never, ever going to meet. You're never going to be satisfied in that. You see how we twist it, right? So we think God doesn't want us to be happy, but in actuality, God wants us to be fully satisfied in him, not be fully satisfied in the flesh. Because the pursuit of flesh literally is the pursuit of mirage. And when we get to the, to, to the end, it's just drinking sand. Like, I say that, do you guys realize, like, that's not fun. Like, literally, if you were to drink a cup of sand, it would not go down well, Okay. Like, my buddy convinced me one time, he's like, hey, dude, like, there's, there's this little challenge, you should try it one time. Like, here, get a teaspoon, you guys are going to laugh at me, I, was, I totally fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, get a teaspoon of cinnamon. If you can swallow it, I'll give you $100. I'm like, I should have known, dude doesn't have $100, first off, and we're in college, for God's sake, I mean, come on, he's, he doesn't have $100. And so, I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I'll do this, that's no problem, like, I'm kind of prideful, you know, I can do anything, he whatever. So I shoved this spoon of, of cinnamon, and I have never felt worse in my life. Like the whole, your nose and your mouth and your throat dries up, and you can't breathe. I seriously thought I was going to have to call the ambulance. Like you're just spraying water in your mouth, and like I was soaked in like not everywhere. It was gross. But anyway, <laughs> like seriously, like drinking sand is not, and that's exactly what we do though. We pursue these things. Like some of you in this room are pursuing an adulterous relationship with someone's not your spouse. And you think that somehow that's going to fulfill your desires, right? Some of us are pursuing like the next big advance at work or the next big thing in our life. Like we want to buy this thing. We think we're going to be satisfied when we get this thing in our lives and we get that thing in our lives and we realize it didn't really meet it. It didn't really meet the thing. It was, it was, it was, do you realize people are more excited? This is science shows this, that people are more excited planning their vacation than when they actually get on the vacation. Some of you guys were like, yeah, amen to that, right? Because when you get there, like Disney World sounds real great until you get there and there's lines and it's hot and like your kids are whining and like, that's not that fun. Like, but we, we, we come up with these ideas that this is what's going to satisfy me. And then when we get there, it doesn't live up to its to its to its thought, right? Because see, we but we think that God doesn't want us to enjoy. He doesn't want us to be happy. But that's not true at all. See, God, see, we think God is more concerned with our obedience than our happiness. Do you realize that? And that's not true. Because God wants our obedience to flow from our satisfaction we find in Him. Think about it this way. Like, if I, if this is the relationship I have with my wife, like, that my satisfaction in my wife flows from my obedience to my wife, like, so if I don't obey, not that she has, like, that I have to obey my wife, like, you know, there's, that sounds bad, doesn't it? She's not like that. You know her. She's not like that. But anyway, she's real gentle and, and, sl and she has a little dark side to it. But anyway, um, <laughs> just, she's not here. She's in Pigeon Forge, so... 
but she does listen to 930 service. Oh, I better shut up. Um, but anyway, so if my relationship with my wife was, okay, so listen, I've got to come home early to get the dishes washed and the floors clean and the kids bathe and all that stuff, because if I don't, she's going to be real mad at me. She's going to be real mad at me. And you forget any kind of kissing tonight, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, like, there's no, none of that's going to happen because she's going to be mad at me. And my whole life, my whole relationship is built on how much I do to please her. And if I don't please her, then my life is not going to be fun, enjoyable, fulfilling. My marriage is going to be awful, right? And this is the thing. Some of us live like that. That's how your marriage is. And like, I'm telling you, the gospel redeems your marriage. If that's your marriage, that's the gospel redeems your marriage because that's not how God intended it. It's not how he intended the relationship we have with him either because our relationship with him is not, okay, you better work, 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 and then I might be pleased with you. Rather, he says, I am pleased with you because of what Jesus has done. And we should say, Praise God that he's accepted me regardless of how bad I've treated him or how wrong, how rebellious I have been. He has accepted me through the blood of Christ. And then our obedience flows from our satisfaction and our joy that we find in who he has made us and who he has saved us to be. So the first thing Paul's not saying is we must suppress our desire for happiness in order to please God. That's not what the Bible says. And that's not what Paul is saying. The second thing is we have to work hard. If you look at those two lists, like there's two lists, right? So we have to work hard against the works of the flesh, the first list, and work, uh, to, to work, to work hard against the works of the flesh and work hard to do the fruits of the Spirit. Like, that's, that's how we can sometimes read that. So, like, we might put up, like, this one side. Okay, these are the works of the flesh, and this is the one side, the works of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Spirit. And so, i got to work really hard to suppress these things in my life, and i got to work really hard to make these things happen in my life. So, you know what? This week, I'm going to stop being jealous. I'm going to stop looking at porn. I'm going to stop having these angry outbursts. I'm going to, like, just, like, buckle down and stop it. You guys ever seen that, that uh, skit from um, uh, Saturday Night Live where this girl goes into the uh, counselor and she's like talking about everything that's going on in her life and the counselor's like, I got a couple words for you. And he just says, stop it. And like she's, tell, she's pouring out. If you guys don't know the video, like I should stop right now because it, it's really funny. You should Google it later on. But that's what like we just think like we need to wake up in the morning and say, I got to stop doing these things and I'm going to just fight against them. I'm not going to do these things anymore. And then on the odd verse, we think, okay, you know what? So I need to really work hard at being loving and patient and kind. I'm going to really work hard at loving this week. I'm going to, be, I'm going to try to be kind. I'm going to really force myself into being kind this week or patient. Let me tell you one thing. I cannot force myself to be patient. Because if there's traffic and any road that I'm on, I will not be patient with it. And I, I know I'm saying I will not be. I just can't. It's not in me. I, it's not natural. I just am an impatient person. I'm, I'm impatient with people. I'm impatient with all kinds of. And my wife would be like, yes, yes, amen, you are. Like, I am an impatient person. And so I am. I struggle with the patience. And so the, the, my, my thing might be, okay, I'm going to stop being impatient. And I'm going to start being patient. I'm going to work on that. And so we might read those lists like that. And we might say, well, well, Paul wants us to work really hard at suppressing these things. And work really hard at making these things work in our lives. And that's not what Paul's saying. You might be thinking, well, what is he saying? Well, you just have to wait because we're getting to that in a second, okay? But we also, in this same realm, we also sometimes look at the fruit of the Spirit. You Listen, like he says in the, in, in the works of the flesh, he actually uses the plural word works when he says works of the flesh. Did you catch that? But then the word for fruit is a singular it's like, it's not plural. We sometimes say fruits of the Spirit, like they're individual fruits of the Spirit. Like I've got to try, like uh, maybe you're good. So sometimes we label ourselves like, well, I'm good with kindness. I'm a pretty kind person, but I wouldn't call myself a patient person. I'm a pretty gentle person, but I wouldn't call myself like a self-controlled person. And so like, at least I'm getting some of them marked off the list, right? 
Like I'm at least I'm like good. I'm, I'm goodness is good a part of me. But like I so that and then like I'm not that patient. Like I may be like weighing the scales a little bit. But that's not the way he presents it here, right? He says there's the works of the flesh, but then there's the fruit, singular fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit means, like, if you go to an apple tree and you say, you know, I really would love to have this apple tree have, like, oranges on it, too. Like, that would be kind of cool. Maybe some pears. I don't like pears. Maybe some pears on there. Like, it'd be nice to have both of those things on this tree. But, like, the, the apple tree only produces one kind of fruit, right? And so what Paul's saying is you, if you're truly a Christian, only produce one kind of fruit, and it shows up in nine different things. The fruit of someone who is, has the Spirit of God that lives inside of them is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so it's not up to us to try to work on one of them. Even though that's kind of how we read this passage, it's not up to us to try to work on one of them. The last thing is that Paul's not saying is that we receive this, when we receive the Spirit, we no longer struggle with sin. And see, this is one we project on other people and we sometimes project on us. We kind of get dejected when like, okay, so I struggle and man, like, and that Romans 7 comes out like, I want to do these things, but I do these things. And why is it I want to do these things and I do these things? Like, we think that once you get the Spirit, once you're a Christian, like, they should be cleaning up their life, right? They, I mean, their things should be, why are they still, why am I still struggling with this? Or why are they still struggling with this? Like, come on, clean up. You've got the Spirit of God. You're a Christian now. You can't act like that. You can't talk like that. You can't live like that. That, right? And that's kind of how we would read this path. Like, okay, you have the Spirit of God, now you no longer struggle. But then if you look at these verses, if you look at, there's four verbs that Paul uses in this passage. He uses walk by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, or I'm sorry, I'm getting off track here, or I'm getting out of, out of alignment here. He uses, in verse 16, he uses walk by the Spirit. In verse 18, he says be led by the Spirit. In verse 25, he says live by the Spirit, and then also walk by the Spirit. And in, in another translation, he says, keep in step with the Spirit. Those are four different verbs that he uses, and it, and, and, and it would seem like if we have the Spirit, we shouldn't be struggling with, with sin, that the Spirit is somehow some kind of secret sauce. Like if you get the Spirit of God, now you have the secret sauce and you don't have to. But that's not what, what, what Paul is presenting. If you look at the word, just the first one, the Expositor's Bible Commentary defines the first being walking in the Spirit. It says the present tense of the verb walk points to a continuing condition or need for it. Do you hear that? It's a continu continuing condition or need for walking in the Spirit. It's a present tense. It's perpetual, habitual life of following and walking in the Spirit as opposed to a pursuit of something that just feels good. See, but we think walking in the Spirit... Like, I gotta just, like, everything's fixed in my life. But that's not how it works. This is a perpetual life change. So, what is Paul saying? I've kind of got ahead of myself a little bit, but what is Paul saying? Paul is saying this it's not about suppressing our desires, it's about fulfilling our desires in that which really satisfies. You hear that? It's about fulfilling your desire. Like, you have a desire for happiness. Okay, let me tell you how to get it a life in the Spirit. A life guided by the Spirit, a life led by the Spirit, a life walked in the Spirit, a life lived in the Spirit, a life keeping in line, in, in, in line with the Spirit. That's, it, pursue your happiness, but pursue it in the right thing. Stop pursuing the mirage. Because the mirage is going to leave you wanting. It's going to leave you thirsty. It's going to leave you desiring. But the Spirit of God living inside of us, Jesus Christ himself said, I am the bread of life. I am the, 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 the true drink, the water that, that, that leaves you thirsty no more. And so stop pursuing the things. So it doesn't say suppress desires. It says pursue desires in the right place. The second thing Paul is saying is we cannot conquer our flesh or live out the fruit of the Spirit by our own strength and fortitude. 
We can't go out and say, you know what, I'm going to really work hard at doing these things. But see, this is the thing. What happens inside of us in this battle is this battle is waged in us. And the spirit is slowly taking over the flesh that's inside of us. I was kind of imagining this in my, as I was mowing last week, and I was looking at the side of my house, I'm like, my goodness, our vines, like we have these vines that grow up the side of our house. Like there, at one point I look, I was looking, and I'm like, oh, there's a trellis in there. Like there is literally a trellis in there, but it is so covered up in vines that it's lost. Like it's, it's just blowing up. Right. And so I'm going, I go over to it and I just start ripping vines off. Like I'm ripping them off the side. Like it's growing up into my, like, um, my, my vinyl siding and stuff. Like just, I'm like, this is bad. Like it's gone out of control. Right. And so I'm ripping this stuff off and I'm thinking the whole time, like, this is what God needs to do in me. He needs to rip away the overgrowth of sin in my life. Because what happens when he starts ripping away the overgrowth of sin in my life? Things can flourish and grow and look beautiful again, right? And that's what happens in us. See, like, we're, we think that we have to go out and fight, but really what we need to do, see, this is, and if you're a farmer, you know this to be the truth. You can work, and you can work the fields, and you can work and, and, and make ever, all the right decisions and everything, but at the end of the day, the only way a, a, a crop produces a fruit is if God intended it to happen. That's why Paul goes from the works of the flesh, which is like having, like we have some kind of control over the works of the flesh, and he switches it to nature. That the fruit of the Spirit is not dependent upon us. The fruit of the Spirit is dependent on, upon the Spirit. The fruit will come in your life if you're in the Spirit of God. But then the last thing that Paul is saying here is life in the Spirit is just that. It's life in the Spirit, a gradual process of the Spirit taking over in our hearts and our lives. See, Paul, those four verbs, walk, be led by, be live by, and keep in step with. Life in the Spirit is a road. It's a path. It is contrasted with a method or a technique. See, there's not three steps, three steps to a Spirit-filled life. Like, okay, here's the ten things you need to do to have the Spirit-filled life. No, no, no. That's not how it is at all. What Paul is resisting the idea idea that it's a set of rules or a technique that can lead you down the path towards God. This is exactly what the Judaizers wanted, right? They wanted a path like, okay, so, okay, you've got Jesus and all that. Now what's the path? And Paul's saying there is no path. It's a life in the spirit and let the spirit take over your life. But obviously, like th there's the, the rules and techniques and, and, and methods don't work. But obviously there's something like we have to have some kind of like he says, walk in the spirit. Like there's a decision, right? The second half of that definition earlier that the word walk in the spirit is an imperative demonstrating the necess necessity of a choice. We have the necessity to choose to walk in the spirit. Now, obviously, if if you're a Christian, like choosing to walk in the spirit, meaning you have to like not gratify the desires of the flesh and that like you can't do that by yourself. I've talked about that. The spirit of God lives inside of us. But there is a, a waking up in the morning and saying, Lord, would you help me to walk in your spirit? Being led by the spirit. See, being led by the spirit does not imply passivity, but rather the need to allow oneself to be led. It's, and so the analogy that I had this week was it's not like being led by the Spirit is not like a pace car in NASCAR, where the pace car is kind of, you're following the pace car, but you have your own motor, and you're just like, you know, following the, the pace of the car in front of you. Rather, it's like a locomotive. Jesus, the Holy Spirit is like our locomotive, and we're just being led by the locomotive. We have no control in and of ourselves. We are dependent upon the locomotive to push us forward, right? And that's what it means to be led by the Spirit. But it's perpetual. Living by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit. If we receive the Spirit, uh, the, we receive life from the Spirit, then we receive our marching orders, our source of existence from the Spirit. And since it is true that the Spirit gives us life, it follows that He should also control our lives. And so when we are, like, there's, but then, I, I love this, I, this idea here, this walking in step with the Spirit that we find in verse 25. Because if you're walking in step with the Spirit, it means you're looking at the Spirit and you're saying, wherever He goes is where I'm going to go. 
we used to get a lot of snow in Fargo. And so when someone, you know, when you're the first to walk over the path in the snow, like you get your boots and, you know, you're getting your feet. If you didn't wear the right boots, you're going to have wet feet all day long because you're the one that's making the path, right? The second person, they're following in the footsteps of the person. And like, so if they have like a big, like I've got short legs. And so if it was a tall person, I'd be like this, you know, like I got to, but I got to follow their path, right? To not get my feet wet. And that's what we do with the spirit of God. The spirit of God, we are walking in step with the spirit. We're saying, God, where are you going? Where do you want me to go? Where, where are you leading me? Where are you guiding? I'm listening. I'm listening to where he guides me. Because I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on the spirit. Like I'm living and I'm walking in the way of the spirit. So I want to kind of close with this. George Mueller was a, um, a, he, he, uh, he ran some orphanages in, uh, in Europe, and, one, and he was known for his prayer life. Uh, George Mueller, the stories of George, like the next morning, like the kids are all in bed, and George Mueller says, we have no food for tomorrow morning. And so the guy that's with him says, well, you know, he's like brainstorming some things they could do, like let's go to the groceries, no, there's no money, like, so let's do this. And so George Mueller, rather than going, you know, doing something on his own, he stops and he, and he, and he gets to his knees and he prays and then at, at some point in the night someone knocks on the door and drops off food for the next morning and George Mueller lived by faith and so it was it was it, he's an awesome if you read an, a biography read George Mueller's biography like biographies a great man of faith but he share, he shares this in his autobiography it says this he says I saw more clearly than ever that the first Great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord. Listen to that. How much I might serve the Lord. What I might do for Him today. And how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state. And how my inner man might be nourished. Now what is it? What is the food for the inner man? Not prayer, but the word of God. See, George Mueller learned that the secret of walking by the Spirit is meditating on the precious truths of the word of God until your heart is happy in God, resting in His promises. And that, see, that's at the heart of the life in the Spirit. It's when I'm, where the Spirit begins to take over in my life. And see, this is our call today. Are you happy in the Lord? Or do you feel like you're like God's more concerned with your obedience and your happiness and you don't really understand who God is because God wants us to be satisfied. He, he starts the chapter off. Remember what he starts? For freedom, Christ has set us free. He wants to set us free to live in the life of the Spirit, to live a life of love, that we are loved and thus we can love. He wants us to live in the light of the Spirit. He wants to live this life of joy, where joy is unceasing. Ha happiness is not based on the way I feel right now or what's going on in the circumstances of my life, that I, my joy is eternal. It's kept in heaven. Like uh, That's where my joy is found, and that's a fruit of the Spirit. He wants us to have peace in our life. He wants us to, our lives to be defined by peace. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Let me hear. Let me hear me hear me say this. What he's saying there is the same thing he says in Romans chapter one. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no law in the Spirit of God. There's no law in the fruits of the Spirit because the fruits of the Spirit free us to live how God calls us and how God has designed us to live. But the war or the, the, the flesh and the works of the flesh are, are, are captives. We're captives to the works of the flesh. So Paul is saying, be free. Are you happy in the Lord? Does the fruit of the Spirit show in your life? Not because you're forcing it, but because it's there. 
this is the reality. Some of us in this room have been walking with, or we say, we say, well, I, I trusted Christ when I was this age. I walked an aisle. I, I prayed a prayer. I, I started going to church. or have, I've heard it in a lot of different ways. But if you look at your life, and you put your life in measure to the fruits of the Spirit, does your life, is your life defined or, or becoming more and more defined by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because if, if that's the case, like if you look at your life and say, now, I mean, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say it like, I wouldn't say that at all about my life. I mean, maybe some aspects of it, but not others. Like I, I still am, am, am a rage rage dude. Like I, I rage about things and I get angry. And I, I wouldn't, I mean, I, I have no patience at all. And, you know, I'm not kind or gentle or, or, and those aren't growing in me either. And I don't really have a desire. Like, then maybe that conversion or that thing that happened when you were whatever age you say you were, maybe that really wasn't that. I mean, maybe, maybe if you look at your life, you say, my life is more defined by the pursuit of the flesh, the works of the flesh, and I'm pursuing those things, and I'm find, I'm seeking, and I'm turning over stones. And see, this is this is the reality. If you look at these two things, the the works of the flesh, Paul presents them as chaos. He just lists them like these. He's rolling off the tongue, right? And at the very end, he says this. Things like these. He said, I could keep on going. You're pursuing one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing, and they're all empty. And then he says, This is the fruit of the Spirit. And it's this orderly thing, this beautiful picture, right? If you look at your life and it looks like the side of my house with vines growing everywhere, and there's chaos, and the chaos. You can't even see the beauty from all the chaos. Then the call for you today is to say, God, hey, take my life. I surrender it all to you. We're going to sing a song in just a second. And that's the words of the song. Lord, give me, or Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. That's our prayer. Our prayer is that God would have his way in us. He would change us and shape us and mold us and recreate us so that our joy, our fulfillment, our satisfaction, our pleasure is found in him and our obedience and our, and our working and our doing comes out of that satisfaction we have in him. So if you've never trusted in Christ, the call is to give your life to him. I'll be up front. I'd love to talk to you. I'll be here at, after the service as well. But if you're here today, you just need to pray. Maybe you need to pray with someone. I'll be up front. I'd love to pray with you. Or if you want to come up front and, and pray here at the stage, you can do that. Whatever the Lord may be leading you to do, respond. But let it, let it be this, that every breath that you take, every moment you're awake, that the Lord would have his way in your heart. Have his way in your life. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, God, as the band comes forward, God, I pray that you would begin to work. God, you're already working, God. You are working. The reason that we're in this seat today is because of your will and purpose in our lives, God. This is not a happenstance. This is not a, 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 a well, you know, I just decided to come today. No, you prompted us to be here today. You prompted me to say what I said, God. We trust that your spirit's working in that way. So we, we, our job right now is to respond. Respond however you're calling, however you're leading, God. And God, you do what only you can do in our hearts to move us. And God, I pray that prayer as we sing it now. Have your way in us. Have your way in us, God. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.